Welcome back. This is video four of module three, talking about cartography in this module. Last time I talked a little bit about symbology and how it's important to learn and recognize standard cartographic symbols because that's part of the language of cartography. If you learn the standard symbols, you'll be able to make a map where the map reader who understands standard symbols will be able to get a better quality information out of the message you're trying to send. You also need to be careful with what type of data, what the measurement level of the data is. Remember there's nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And depending upon the type of measurement, you're going to use a different symbology approach. Okay, this time I'm going to talk about classification. And in the past, a lot of those maps I showed you from back in history, those were what were called reference maps. And reference maps are maps that basically allow you to find your way around the landscape. There's another very common type of map that's used, and that's called a thematic map. And so you can go out to the Esri Dictionary, GIS Dictionary, and you can look up thematic map. And a thematic map is a map designed to convey information about a single topic or theme. So a single topic map is a thematic map. You can see in the definition that it says, see also choropleth map. So I'm going to look up choropleth map out at the Esri site. And I see that the definition for a choropleth map is a thematic map in which areas are distinctly colored or shaded to represent classed values of a particular phenomenon. And so there's kind of two key pieces to this definition. One is that a choropleth map involves areas. Okay. Another is that it uses classed values. So the values that the measurements take are grouped or classed into groups or categories in the map and they're grouped according to areas. And so those two aspects of a choropleth map are what you need to consider when you're making your cartography choices. So when I go back to the Esri Gist Dis Dictionary, I look up classification. What the heck is classification? That's the process of sorting or arranging entities into groups or categories. So we're going to take all the data that has multiple numeric values and we're going to sort them or arrange them into groups or categories. That's what classification is about. There's some things we need to keep in mind when we're doing classification and among those are standardization, whether you need to do it or not, the number of class intervals that you want to use, the number of groups, what type of classification technique you want to use, and how are you going to symbolize this on the map that you provide. So first let's look at standardization. Again, here's the definition of a choropleth map. It involves areas and classed values. But what's going to happen in a map is generally the areas, the polygons on your map, are not going to all be the same size. So some of the areas will be larger, some of the areas will be smaller on your map. And generally, large areas contain more of a phenomenon than smaller areas. So you can imagine, let's say we have uh, a state that grows corn, and we've divided the state up into areas by the counties within the state. Well, if the state grows corn, chances are good that there's going to be more acres of corn in larger counties and fewer acres of corn in smaller counties. So when you make a map, if you don't standardize, the message you'll be sending is basically larger counties have more corn. But if you want to send a message that's how much of a particular county in terms of a percentage of a particular county is in corn, you might want to standardize that. Or how much of all the corn that's grown in the state is grown in this county, you might want to standardize that way. So there's kind of two ways to standardize. One is you divide your measure by the total area of that polygon that you're going to report it for. So let's say I have 100 acres in this county that's 1,000 acres in area. I'm going to have 10% of that county in corn. Different counties might have different percentages. Another way to do it is to divide it by the total of the, of the phenomenon. So let's say I have 1,000 acres of corn throughout the state and 100 acres of corn are in this county, then 10% of all the corn is in this county. So depending upon the message you want to send, you can standardize one or two ways. 
you need to be careful of a couple of issues that is, are associated with choropleth maps. One is called the modifiable aerial unit problem, and another is the ecological fallacy. I'll talk about those in Module 4, but what those involve is the thinking that Sometimes areas are defined kind of arbitrarily, so depending upon how you define your area, you can send a different message. And sometimes people tend to believe that since you report one number for an entire area, everything inside of that area is associated with that number. And so I'll talk more about those in Module 4. Okay, classification type. There's a whole bunch of types you can use. ArcGIS has quite a few of those types. One of the types is called natural breaks and that's an algorithm that looks at your data and it decides where the data fit naturally which measures which sample points kind of fit together into a group and which might fit into another group so it looks at the breaks that occur naturally in the data it doesn't matter where they are in the data and it tries to set intervals that group together measures that are similar so that's Jenks it's an algorithm it's going to do the best it can equal interval says What's my minimum value? What's my maximum value? Divide that total range by the number of classes that I want to use and make each interval that size. So each interval or each class has the same size. You can think of this as maybe uh, grades in a course. So we might make intervals that are 10 points wide. So 50 to 60 is an F and 60 to 70 is a D and 70 to 80 is a C. And and on. So equal interval might apply to, us to something like that. Quantile says how many points do we have that we're representing in this map? Let's say we have a hundred points. We want to break it up into intervals so some percentage of all the points are in each interval. So let's say we want five intervals and we have a hundred points. We're going to break up the data so that there are 20 points in each interval. So what the computer does is it ranks the data from low to high. It finds out where each interval should fall and it cuts the intervals off so that each interval has the same number of points. Standard deviation is a way of classifying things that are normally distributed. I'll talk a little bit about statistics but not till the end of this course. Um, you can use this classification method if you have normally distributed data and that's going to allow you to understand more about how much or what percentage of the data lies a certain distance from the mean of the data. So you can make intervals that are one, two, three standard deviations from the mean and that way your intervals will give you an idea of what percentage of the data lies inside of that interval. And if all else fails you can set the intervals manually. You can drag or drop in the ArcGIS or you can put the numbers that you want as your class breaks in the ArcGIS. You probably get a lot of, a lot of experience doing this making maps in your labs. Okay, you also need to be considered to be concerned about symbolization. How do you symbolize these choropleth maps? Color is important or shade. You need to remember again that there are colorblind people out there or that your map might get colored on a black and white copier. You need to keep that in mind. I'll talk more about color in the next video. You need to keep in mind what your levels of measurement are. You don't want to use certain symbols for certain levels of measurement. For instance, if you have a ratio level of measurement, that's the one that you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Generally, you want to use symbols that vary from one shade to another shade, or one degree of saturation of a color to another degree of saturation of color. You generally don't want to use different colors. There's kind of an exception to that, and I'll show you an example in a little bit later. What type of symbolization you want to use? You can use sequential, that's light to dark, let's say. You can use diverging, where you do use two colors, and the light is in the very middle of your data, and a dark one color is at one end, and a dark another color is at another end. So that's going to use two different colors. And you can use spectral, which goes through all the colors of the spectrum. So here's an example from your text. This is a gap analysis land cover map. Uh, the gap program is a program that evaluates land cover and species habitats and tries to identify areas that would be well suited for species that maybe are underrepresented or threatened or endangered in the environment. If you look at 
the symbolization of this map and this is nominal data right so it doesn't really have numbers associated with it but this map is symbolized with different colors for each category and so generally the categorical the nominal and the ordinal data will use different colors for each category if I zoom in on this you can see that there are a whole bunch of different land cover categories that the gap analysis program recognizes so if you're going to be making a gap analysis land cover map you need to use the colors and the symbology that are standard for a gap analysis program so you need to go out to the gap analysis site and see what these colors are and which land cover types they're associated with that way when you make the map the person who's used to looking at gap analysis maps will see the symbols and understand what they mean the language will be consistent between you the map maker and the map reader here's another example of nominal data categorical data and this is a geology map a geologic map of South Carolina. Again if you zoom in on the legend you see that we have different colors for each category. There really aren't numbers that you can associate with each category so this would be nominal data and in this case the symbology that's used is the symbology that's defined or preferred by the USGS. So you would go out to the USGS site and you would see what the symbology standards are for geologic maps and then you would be able to draw your map using the symbology that applies to the type of geology that you have in the area of your map. You'd send the message to the geologic map reader that the map reader would be able to understand just by looking at the symbols. Okay, you can go to some numeric data. These are some examples again from your book of numeric data. This is ratio data, right? That's the one that you can do all the mathematical operations on. So there is a zero for each one of these and you can see in the title that these maps are population density so this data has been standardized so we have South Carolina we have all the counties so some of the counties are smaller and some of the counties are larger so instead of just taking the number of persons in each county and symbolizing it that way they've divided the number of persons in each county by the area of that county and they come up with a population density standardized Here's two different ways of setting the class intervals for the same data. This one is equal intervals, so it takes the total range from 24 to 450. It divides it by, in this case, 5. You divided, you've decided to do five different classes. And it puts intervals that are equal in width. So it looks like they're roughly, what, 80, 70 to 80 people apart. Okay? This is Jenks, and Jenks looks at all the data and tries to group things where they naturally fit. So in this case, the lightest color or equal intervals are 24 to 110. Over here, the lightest color are 24 to 54. So these are two different class intervals that are determined using two different methods. You'll get two different looking maps. So in this case, you look at these two counties. They show up as different symbols when you use equal intervals. Over here, they show up as the same symbols. So depending upon the message you want to use, you might use one version of classification versus another. This lower example is another population density. It's the same data, persons per square mile, but it uses a standard deviation classification scheme. Now if the county populations were distributed normally, the bell-shaped normal curve for county populations, this would be a good one. And so what does this one show you? This one shows you that the red is low minus 0.49 or less standard deviations from the mean, right? So this is off to the left side of that bell curve. This is off way off to the right side of the bell curve. So it appears that there are two counties in South Carolina that have much larger population densities than the other counties in South Carolina. So that's kind of the message this map sends. You see there are only two dark counties versus these maps where there are multiples, even though this one only has two, it has others that are close to that. This is another standard deviation map, but it's using a different color scheme. So this would be what you would call a diverging color scheme. And what you have is light color in the middle. Dark red is for the left-hand side of the curve. Dark green is for the right-hand side of the curve. So this is a diverging color scheme. This is a diverging color scheme with different colors at the edges. These are sequential color schemes, light to dark of that color, light to dark of that color. 
Okay, that was really fast fly through of classification. It's important that you consider how you're going to classify the data to send the message that you want to send to your map readers. So next time I'll talk a little bit about color and how important it is to make the proper choices of color in your map so that you don't confuse your map reader but you allow the map reader to absorb the message you're sending with a minimum amount of confusion or dissonance. So that's what I'll talk about next time.